This Artificial Intelligence and Equality podcast is hosted by Carnegie Council Senior Fellow Anya Kasperson. Together with Wendell Wallach and an International Advisory Board, they direct the Carnegie Artificial Intelligence and Equality Initiative, AIEI, which seeks to understand the innumerable ways in which AI impacts equality and international affairs. This episode features Jeff Mulgan. It was recorded on December 20th, 2023. So welcome to our special episode with Jeff Mulgan, a renowned expert in social innovation, public policy and technology, celebrated for his influential work on the implications of technology in society and governance. Jeff's list of achievements is extensive, but we'll touch on a few notable ones with a full list available in the transcript. He currently serves as a professor of collective intelligence, public policy and social innovation at University College London. His past roles include Chief Executive of Nesta, Visiting Professor at University College of London and the University of Melbourne, and significant positions in UK politics spanning over many years. Holding a doctorate in telecommunications, Jeff is also an accomplished author known for his bold and, in my view, very important writings on a variety of subjects, including social innovation and ways of stimulating social and political imagination. We are incredibly honored to have Jeff Morgan with us today to reflect on the year 2023, talk about his latest book, and also look ahead to 2024, a year likely to be as paradigm shifting as this one. Welcome, Jeff. It's so nice to have have you with us. Thank you very much, Anya. It's great to be with you all today. So let's dig into um some questions to unpack a little bit of your journey and and also that of your of your scholarship jeff through your extensive journey across various fields you have gained profound insights into the role of technology in our society could you share with us how this journey unfolded what pivotal moments or influences if i may led you to this deep interest in the intersection of technology society and governance Wow. Well, I have, a, I have a quite a messy career, which doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense. My first job was in, in city government, and I then went to MIT to learn about technology, which was hanging out with the people who were then creating the internet. And I guess ever since then, I've been worried that the world of politics and policy doesn't really understand the world of technology and vice versa. And this has led to 30 years of mistakes and miscommunications which in many ways are only getting worse. Uh, I had quite a long spell in the UK government running the strategy team there and policy for the the prime minister. And that was another period when we were attempting to put in place new approaches to what was then called e-government, e-commerce, all these things which were really prompted by the internet, which suggested the need to radically remake our systems and our structures, our, our ways of thinking. And I actually wrote a book in the mid 90s about that, trying to think through what the dilemmas would be of an internet world, where we were much more connected, where uh, we'd be aware of things like climate change, how our behaviours impact on others. I think I greatly underestimated many of the pathologies of the internet. I was probably too optimistic uh, then. And then in other roles, I ran for quite a long time Nesta, which was the UK's National Endowment for Science technology and the arts, slightly unusual in linking science tech and arts and the creative economy. And so was a funder for quite a long period of digital innovations, running investment funds, and also funds for commissioning AI uh, in, in the public sector. So I've tried to oscillate, as it were, between sitting within bureaucracies. In many ways, I'm a bureaucrat. I'm a boring bureaucrat. I quite you know, like making uh, systems and rules and processes and laws Another strand working in technology, at least trying to understand it. And now I'm in an engineering department at at UCL. But then probably a third leg, I've often been an activist. I was as a teenager, a political activist, and trying to be also connected to the the currents of change, of progressive change around the world, which have often been in tension with the bureaucracies and with the technologists. Speaking about your background, you also trained as a Buddhist monk in Sri Lanka during your formative years. Would you say that that experience shaped your curiosity about what it means to be human, you know, which is a a theme that sort of is an undercurrent in a lot of your writing? Yeah, well, as a teenager, I was kind of in some ways quite a classic 
angry political activist. And then I, I went to Sri Lanka and got to know uh, an amazing Buddhist thinker called Nyanaponakatera, who taught me a lot. I was a failed, very much a failed monk. But in a way, his main message was you have to change yourself before you change the world. Otherwise, your pathologies will be realized uh, in the world. And I've remained very interested in, in Buddhist thinking. I helped set up a and an interesting organization called Action for Happiness, which has the Dalai Lama as our patron, trying to promote, in some ways, very Buddhist ideas uh, in, in everyday life. And one of the themes I've tried to grapple with in, in my latest book about science is wisdom. My, my, what's my great fear of the last 30 or 40 years is we've had an amazing explosion of technologies for, for cognition, or for reasoning, and algorithms, and so on, but perhaps not much, if any, advance in our collective wisdom. Uh, and this is obviously not a new insight. It's been talked about for 100, 150 years, the problem of technology advancing without requisite wisdom. But perhaps it's even more of an issue now as our technology has become so immensely powerful. So do you draw a distinction between intelligence and wisdom? Well, many people think of there being a, a sort of continuum from grasping data, let's say, through to knowledge, through to wisdom, which isn't just an accumulation of cleverness or reasoning or algorithmic intelligence. I mean, what's really interesting about how, in fact, all civilizations have thought about wisdom through the years is it's somewhat different from cleverness and, in, and narrow intelligence in that it usually certainly involves an ethical dimension an ability to integrate many, many different ways of thinking, not just a single way of thinking, and attention to context, and very acute attention to the human context, the historical context, the cultural context. And we are surrounded by wonderful algorithms, but the one thing they're actually very bad at doing is, is all of those different aspects of wisdom. So we have definitely super intelligence in certain kinds, but uh, very little advance, uh, advance in terms of computational Wisdom, despite some efforts, Japan in particular had a big stream of work on uh, on computational wisdom, but it didn't really deliver much yet. So my hope is in the next 10 or 20 years, some of the enormous efforts going into um, large language models and the outer reaches of, of, um, of AI might slightly divert to us, are these actually uh, enhancing our capacity to be wise, both individually and collectively? And are they, to riff on what you said earlier, or are they simply enhancing the underlying, some would call it conditioning in, in us as humans, but you call them pathologies, once we embed our own pathologies into algorithms? Well, certainly the, the business models of the internet have greatly played on exploiting our, our pathologies, our, our, our biases, our predilections, our compulsions. Uh, and this was something very underrated at the, as I mentioned earlier, I was involved with many of the people sort of creating the, the internet, the World Wide Web and so on. Almost none of them had any sense of how platform technologies would be so directed in that, that way to try and, uh, as I say, encourage often very compulsive behaviours, let alone then to amplify uh, misinformation, folly of all kinds, distortions, and lies. So we've created a, an extraordinary set of machineries, which not no one really intended them to do this, but which have often more amplified collective stupidity than collective wisdom. And I think now is definitely a moment to take stock of that and also see what was wrong in our mental models, which led so much of the world, the computer scientists, Silicon Valley, the investors, to, to get this wrong, not to really understand the technologies they were bringing into, into the world. Which is a great segue to delve into your latest book, which is, has the appropriate title, When Science Meets Power, which aptly captures, the, in my view, uh, the essence of current global dynamics, where new scientific capabilities are indeed transforming not just who holds power, but the very nature of power itself. Uh, we actually did a separate podcast on power a few months ago, digging into this, this topic. Jeff, if I may ask you, if you can guide us, you touched on a few issues I know is reflected in your book as, uh, as well, you know, throughout this conversation. But could you guide us to the core premise of your book and also share some 
key excerpts from it that you think our listeners might find enlightening and help them think through some of these big issues that we are faced with? Well, first, the book is an attempt to describe or diagnose what I see as the problematic relationship between science and power right now. And almost every week you see a new example uh, of this. There are the obvious examples, which is the anti-science uh, you know, uh, drives of people like Ron DeSantis in the US, but equivalents all over the world, who really reject the very premise of scientific discovery and scientific knowledge. Uh, and that's not going to go away. That could get much worse in the next few years. But in some ways, that's the relatively easy cases. I think the harder cases are where, where well-intentioned scientists and well-intentioned politicians clash or fail to understand each other. Here in the UK, in the last few months, we've had an inquiry into COVID, a fascinating inquiry with all the political leaders and the scientists having to give evidence in an inquiry. And both sides come out pretty badly. The politicians, like Boris Johnson, simply didn't understand a lot of what the science was saying. And they took refuge under the slogan, we will only follow the science. And yet, of course, the science didn't really tell you what to do. It might tell you that there was an epidemic and infection rates might go uh, become exponential and that you had to therefore act decisively to, to lock down or to shut your borders. But beyond that, science couldn't tell politicians how to weigh up the interests of the young against the old, health against the economy, you know, what might be acceptable infringements on civil liberties. So this hiding behind the language of following the science rather quickly fell apart. And the scientists were very interesting in their, um, their evidence, very smart people. But often they realized they were almost becoming executives. They were making decisions, but they didn't have the training, the preparation for making these very complex decisions. It wasn't clear what their accountability was. In theory, they were just advisors. The politicians were making all the, all the decisions. And often they had very unbalanced sort of disciplinary background. So yeah, often they knew a lot about biomedical science, but very little about mental health issues, which very quickly came to the fore. Uh, and in the US, the, the, the congressional interrogations of Anthony Fauci are very interesting in the same way some of them are very much anti-science people trying to undermine a very senior scientist. But his own responses about the testing in Wuhan, about the US NIH role in funding what many people see as incredibly dangerous research on pathogens, gain-of-function research, and so on, I think to many people looks not all that wise <laughs> And the fact that I uh, start the book with the fact that in many big cities around the world, there are BSL-4 labs, labs doing very, very dangerous uh, research on bioorganisms. But so just to, cases, just, to, just to inform our listeners, so there are four levels, right, of biosecurity. Yeah. So maybe you want to say something about that? So this is pretty much the most dangerous level for which you need very strict you know, rules and regulations. They appear in Hollywood movies with people dressed in, you know, has has hazard suits of all kinds, but these are often located in big cities. And it's possible, I think we now it now looks clear there probably wasn't a leak from the Wuhan lab, but it could have been a leak from the Wuhan lab, which is one of these facilities which started the pandemic. So here was science doing often very intelligent, very important work, but not with a very healthy relationship with the public or with democracy, and not very good at explaining what it's doing and why it's doing it. And the other issue, of course, in 2023 was artificial intelligence, which is a, you know, a product of extraordinary science over the last 50 or 60 years. But the, the politicians of the world really struggle <laughs> to make sense of what their role should be. Should they be banning things, regulating it, investing huge amounts of public money to get competitive advantage, making their military ever more automated? All of these are, are, are choices, but none of them were able to really deliberate on it very intelligently. And, and in some ways, this, this leads to the core argument I make in the book is that we collectively, as humans, as a society, do need to shape science and technology. It is an enormous force for good and an enormous force for harm. That has been obvious ever since the nuclear bombs of the, of the 1940s and is even more true of AI or quantum or new genetics, synthetic biology, a whole array of fields where science is both 
immensely potentially powerful for the good and immensely dangerous. Our only collective means of steering and guiding science is ultimately through politics and governments, which pass laws and set rules and allow some things and ban other things, fund some things, defund others. But our politics is more and more incapable of playing this role. And I call this the science politics paradox that only politics can guide science. But politics in its current forms is woefully ill-suited to guiding science. I argue science on its own isn't really very well placed to self-govern, though many scientists in the past believed in a dream of self-government of science, which in many ways made a lot of sense about 100 years ago, but makes ever less sense as science becomes so interwoven into daily life and so powerful in its effects on our our air, our health, our our, our brains uh, even. And this is why I think we need really a, a rethink of almost all the places in which power and science intersect, from advice to parliaments to laws and regulations from the national level to the global. And and in my book, I try and sketch out what some of those changes might look like. You penned a thought-provoking article uh, titled, Can Democracies Afford Incompetent Leaders? Which I assume sort of builds on some of the core tenets of your book as well that you just spoke about. The article addresses the what you call the gaps between leaders' capabilities and the need of our times. And the two cases, both AI and, and also how do we deal with pandemic or how do we build stronger societal resilience in societies is definitely like two kind of core parts of that. Do we have leaders, in your view, capable of navigating in these challenging times? I mean, you alluded to it already that we may not have that. But what's the article about? And, and how does it build on, on what you just spoke about from your book? So I think we often have pretty able leaders. I think they get a bit of a, a, a bad press unfairly. It's easy to knock them. And this particular piece was mainly prompted by the fact that I, I've taught in many government colleges around the world, from China and Singapore to US and Canada and Australia and, and Europe. But the weird thing about most of those is that they do try and train the civil servants to better understand things like technology and science and what's happening to international law and all these, all this sort of stuff. But the politicians who are ultimately making the decisions usually get no training at all. It's about the only serious profession which is treated as completely amateur. You can become a president or a prime minister with literally not an hour of training or anyone even asking you whether you're, you're qualified to do the job. And that might have been okay at some points in our history when the decisions politicians had to make you know, could be made with intuition and experience and so on. But they are more and more having to deal with issues which are highly complex and highly scientific. So, I mean, in the last three or four years, it is pandemics, it is AI, it is, you know, what do you do about a mental health crisis? These are the sort of the everyday issues or climate change adaptation which do require at least a baseline of of skills and and knowledge. Now, in China, um, ministers, governors, others do get fairly serious training at the the party schools and other academies. And they have to do residential training every year. The US has some infrastructure for training politicians in places like like the Kennedy School. And Bloomberg runs a, a program to train mayors, which started about five years ago. And Australia actually now has a new academy for politicians, a very good one called the McKinnon Institute. But in many countries, there's essentially nothing. And that means that even if you have a pretty you know, able politician who wants to do the right thing, they will just flounder if they're faced with a highly complex challenge. And I think we have a bit of the same problem with bureaucrats, although, as I say, there are many colleges and MPA programs in universities and so on. Most civil servants tend to have a background in law and economics. Not so many actually have backgrounds in science or data or computer science or the things which are increasingly important to the decisions uh, they're making. And again, that's bound to mean a problem of capability for the government as a whole. So one of the things I, I argue in the book as well is we need to seriously attend to the skills of our decision makers. There's a different kind of curriculum they need compared to 
a generation or two ago. We also actually need a bit of a curriculum for the public who have to, you know, at least make decisions about decisions, even if they're not directly making laws and so on. When I was at university, I did a course called PPE at Oxford University, which was set up 100 years ago called Philosophy, Politics and Economics. That was thought to be the really forward looking way to train people to run governments, to help them prepare to do macroeconomics and stuff like that. And that was you know, fairly progressive 100 years ago. And it's still the course which many leaders in Britain have done. But it's completely inadequate for the actual things coming across their desks, which, as I say, are far more likely to involve a lot of complex science and data and statistics and uh, and an assessment of complex and often ambiguous uh, evidence. So I, I think every country needs an academy for politicians at a minimum and an overhaul of the training for public servants, national government, city government and elsewhere, whose curriculums they've gone through are often very out of date compared to the tasks they're having to do. It is interesting because this also tells, you know, it sort of tells a story about outlook, where you are in the world, because I also did a course as a student called PPE, but econ but economy was not economy, it was ethics. And I think that's the, that's the often missing component on it. And also that we are increasingly, I would say, kind of, making ethics into something is not we talk about ethical ai or ethical technology and don't even get me started on the use of the word responsible but ethical ai or ethical anything can be ethical but still very harmful and i think that's the the, the sort of tension point that we need to grapple with so ethics to the carnegie council and the work that we do and we will get to that that we also been doing together has very much been trying to promote a new line of ethics, a new theory of ethics that pushes the focus on to how do we deal with those tension points? How do we grapple with uh, the trade-offs that inevitably is going to follow any decision that allows you to use and develop these technologies that hold so much power and can impact so many people at scale? And then using words like ethics, and which often just becomes a a sort of nice way of talking about economics, <laughs> economies at scale, right? And it's it's like it's it's a problem. Do you see this a lot in your work? This sort of, you know, miss you know ethics being used in rather, you know, unscrupulous on un, in in rather cynical ways. Well, yeah, ethics risks being a kind of spray on aerosol. Early in twenty four, I will be publishing a a, a review. I've done, which is quite a boring review on what we've just been talking about. I, I was asked by a couple of institutions in the US to look at current training for both civil servants and politicians around the world. What was in the curriculum? Was it fit for purpose? And I'll be publishing this survey on universities and civil service colleges and so on. But I also looked at what government said they wanted, what were the competences they thought they most needed. And ethics comes very high on that list. They, they claim they want civil servants who are able to reason ethically, to think about issues of integrity. And I hope what they mean by that is not just an ability to spray it on, but to think about the boundary cases. That's when ethics always comes alive, is when you think about the difficult cases, the, you know, the ones where it's not obvious what the right thing to do is, and you learn a way of reasoning with others, which is ethical uh, and, and accountable. And yet this is largely missing from the current training provision for both politicians and civil servants. I have a little bit of an issue, which I, I talk about in the book, about really the language of ethics. And one can take different views on this. But I go back to, to Aristotle, who more than 2,000 years ago did actually suggest the difference between politics and ethics, where for him, at least ethics was mainly about the individual, what is the right, the good life, the right decisions for the individual, and politics is the collective version of that. How does the society decide what is good and right for itself as a, as, as a community, as a, as, a, as a polis? And I think many of the issues which are labelled as ethical are actually political in that sense. They're really about what we collectively decide to do about, uh, about risks or about nuclear power or about you know, the costs and benefits and trade-offs of, of, of carbon adaptation. And I would prefer the various bodies with ethics in their title, perhaps to add in politics as well, to recognize 
these are ultimately small p and big p political uh, judgments, which we all which we all have to make. But that's perhaps a, that's a, a maybe a slightly pedantic argument. Well, it's an interesting one because Aristoteles, of course, was known for his, you know, as one of the, the early thinkers around what later became virtue ethics. You know, to what extent does, you know, your your character speak to the ethical to the ethical consideration that is being done? And one could make that argument when, you know, both in your book and in 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 the article where you're asking, do we have competent enough leaders to navigate these very perilous times? Is that an issue of character or is it issue of instituting an ethics that is much bigger than characters, that is actually a result of a sustained systemic effort as opposed to being left to the individual, which can always be exploited. Once it's left to the individual level, it can be exploited. And it is being exploited. Yeah, you're absolutely right there. I mean, in a way, we have to rely sometimes on delegating to leaders who we hope have sufficiently virtuous characters that they do the right thing under pressure. Uh, They make good decisions and don't just fake it, although there's lots of incentives to just fake it. And that's, in a sense, what we we look for. The other thing, though, which I think is is a great dilemma of the years ahead, is really whether ethics can be almost turned into something like an algorithm. Many people working in AI think of ethics as just a set of rules or principles, which you could, in theory, put into a computer, and it will then spit out what is the ethical answer. Whereas certainly all of my experiences, ethics is fuzzier than that, more ambiguous, and as I said before, more contextual. And what we really want are leaders who can explain how they reached a judgment, combining multiple factors, some of which may come from data and science, some from ethical reasoning, some from politics, and then be held to account for that decision. And I think it's that public discourse uh, about ethics is really important. And in the book, I talk about what I think is a, a really good but very unusual example of that, which might be of interest. This was about well, more than 30 years ago, when human fertilization became a really big issue, cloning, IVF, and so on in the UK. And a huge public debate was held about what the right way forward should be. You know, what should be allowed? What should be licensed? What experiments should be uh, permitted? Parliament had a bigger debate on that than anything it's had since in relation to, to science. And it led to the creation of what was called the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, part of whose duty was to decide. It was a very powerful regulator, which could decide what was lawful, what could be experimented with. But it was also set up with a remit to explain, to communicate its thoughts, its reasonings in real time to the public. And it's basically worked very well in that it's allowed constant innovation and scientific experiment and keeping public confidence and public legitimacy. And for me, what's fascinating is why did we not have anything like that for the internet? Why did we not have anything like that for AI? All these other fields of science were completely lacking that, in a sense, creation of an institution which was simultaneously pro-science, pro-innovation, but also very deeply ethical and very deeply accountable to the public for the often quite subtle judgments it was making about what should be uh, allowed, what was, uh, and other countries have gone, I think, have much more rigid answers to those questions, like banning stem cell research and so on. The HFEA is a is a, an unusual example of relative success in a very controversial space. We actually had a podcast some time ago on what I think you are really pointing to, which is this desperate need to not just bring back but to really refine what we call public space ethics and we had a podcast with an athenian you know a scholar in in this field you know some some months back and we talked about this notion of what does it mean to you know civic ethics or civic dialogue ethics what does it mean to have you know an ethical public space where you discuss these issues you know insights that we very much you mentioned aristoteles earlier and, and these were definitely kind of core to the Athenian society. Now the Athenian society had many things that were less desirable to replicate in modern times, in terms, especially in terms of equality, etc. But there was definitely a strong focus on, you know, having that public discourse. But the public discourse is increasingly, and I know this is a field of your expertise, is increasingly being 
co-opted and sometimes even swallowed whole by the dominant narratives that have nothing to do with the truths or the facts of the situation, but who gets to define what is important and who gets to decide over who make decisions uh, in, this, in this space, particularly related to what you were mentioning before, how we engage with edge cases, you know, as technology is being deployed. Yeah, I mean, the power to, to frame the argument is in some ways the most powerful power. Uh, everything follows from that. But I think there's I think there's also a challenge for the, the world of science itself, which I, I hope with this book, I, I, I'm provoking at least a bit of that discussion. So, as I said a bit before, the scientists often think they shouldn't be accountable to the public. The realm of science should be autonomous. Indeed, there's all sorts of very good reasons in the past why you want science to be autonomous from politics, autonomous from the public, self-referential, able to explore and speculate and go to difficult places. And this was the foundation of the science community, for example, the Royal Society in London, the first sort of scientific institution set up in the mid 17th century was founded on that principle of autonomy. Increasingly, though, I think that doesn't really work, uh, that pure autonomy. Partly for the reasons you said, there has to be a dialogue with the public about the ethics, about the choices, about the border issues, which attends to not just the scientific logic, but also the ethics, also what the public thinks is, is reasonable. And I think there's a deeper political thing going on as well. We've seen in the last five or 10 years an incredible collapse of confidence in science amongst some groups in the US Republican voters, faith in science has, I think, halved roughly in the last uh, five or six years. And here in the UK, there's very worrying polling evidence, which shows that a majority of people don't think R&D benefits them at all. <laughs> it's just quite surprising. Most people have, have no knowledge of what science happens in their area where they live. And in some ways, that's not surprising, because there is no communication with people about what science is done in their area, what the choices are. And that goes back to, I think, a fundamental strategic question of the next 10 or 20 years, which is, what priorities should govern where the brain power of science goes? In the past, there were basically three dominant answers to that. One was the state, which got scientists to make weapons and uh, you know missiles and tanks and so on. There was another view that it should be business, that uh, you should direct science to drive GDP growth. And then the scientists themselves, who thought they should make the decisions through peer review, uh, and autonomy. But the idea of a public values, public preferences, influencing spending on science has always been quite weak. And if you look around the world, I was part of a, a project last year done with the UN where we looked at global spending on science and technology and whether it aligned with the sustainable development goals. The SDGs are what the world has said are its biggest priorities. And perhaps not surprisingly, we found an enormous mismatch that where the money goes, where the brain power goes, does not align very well with what the public thinks are the great priorities of the next 10 or 20 years. And so one of the things I try and look at in the book is what might institutions look like that would help us nudge or at least slightly better align this enormous capacity we now have for, for invention, for science, for exploration and so on, with the issues of Things like you know, food and malnutrition or mental health or decarbonization or you know, lack of water, all the things which the world desperately needs faster innovation on. Whereas at the moment, if you look at where the money goes, I and mean, in the case of um, digital tech, huge amounts spent on click through advertising, <laughs> going back to what you were saying earlier, you know, ways of manipulating people's behavior, but very, very little on how to stop misinformation, how to protect democracy, how to you know, reinforce childhood, protect childhood from, uh, from manipulation. And with AI, I think the same is happening now. Enormous spending on things like YouTube recommendation engines or what have you, but really very little spending even now on what AI could be doing to really improve, for example, job uh, as a project I'm working on at the moment on, you know, how, how people get a new job in an age of AI or education or welfare or these other uh, other fields. And just one, one final example of that, much of the biggest investment next year in AI will, cut, will be into 
So essentially personal assistants, co-pilots, PIs of different kinds, which will try and get to know you, your preferences, uh, your behaviours, and then shape guidance or advice to you about what you should do. To my mind, the biggest potential of these lies in care and welfare systems, people with usually old people, perhaps with multiple conditions, complex lives, needing a lot of help and care. But almost no investment is going to adapt these AI technologies to where the greatest need is. They're being mainly tailored to wealthy executives in the, the global north uh, and the west or to uh, to decisions which link to consumption and spending, not to feels like care. So I think we have a, a massive imbalance between essentially the world's needs and the capabilities of science and technology, which are not aligned with those needs. And given your many, because you held, as you said yourself, you held quite a few significant roles in politics, advising prime ministers, directing work on policy, on innovation, and much of what you are referring to right now requires us, and you're right in saying this, is that we're not making the investment in what I would call the cognitive resilience of people to engage with tools and technologies that would fundamentally alter how you define your own role in that relationship. And I think this is, you know, this is, this is a real ethical, it's not just a conundrum, it's an ethical issue that we need to grapple with soon. And you also mentioned a, another interesting point, you know, and I know you've done some work on this and you had to, I guess, also come to terms with what it means when we are embedding technologies into our children's life the way we are. You spoke earlier about this new kind of addiction economy that we are maybe not intentionally, but unintentionally creating. And this particularly then uh, revolves around children's engagement with technology. And I think we tend to try to regulate technology at the use case level. And we all seen all the discussions in terms of the European AI Act, et cetera, which is very much focused on use cases. But we all know that unless you actually grapple with the very design of these technologies, holding companies and leaders accountable for the intention that is gets set out when these tools are being uh, devised and developed and, and launched, you're not really going to be able to grapple with some of these undesirable ethical outcomes. And this is particularly relevant for those under 18 that are not only being subjected to it, but likely to be held accountable to it because their digital footprint is being mapped in ways that we've never seen before in history. So we're creating a generation that has not only become digital savants in some ways, but they're also becoming subject to the algorithm in ways that previous generations never have been subjected to without having the regulatory frameworks in place. So thinking about that design phase, uh, you know, as a professor of innovation as well and social innovation, what are your thoughts on this? And again, back to your political roles, what do you see as the underlying trends of why are we not getting this right? So well, I agree with all that you've said then. I've, ju I've just finished teaching the first term of a new degree, which um, I helped create, which in a way is trying to be an answer to that question. I, I wish we could get our civil servants and politicians sitting through these undergraduate classes, because the degree is part of engineering, but it's trying to get the, the students to understand technologies don't just sort of come into the world with the world passively uh, adopting them. There always is an interaction, a shaping, an argument. And we, we look at waste and water and all sorts of things. But the car, in some ways, is the simplest example. 150 years ago, cars started you know, appearing on the streets of cities in Germany and elsewhere. And the story then of how the world, in a sense, came to cope with the car, to me, is a fascinating one and quite different from what people expected at the beginning. You know, we learned you had to have speed limits and road markings. You had to have driving tests uh, of all kinds. You had to bring in new rules on drink driving. You then brought in new rules and standards for cars and emissions and catalytic converters. Then there was a sort of a, a shift often driven by concern for childhood with speed bumps to radically slow cars down in some neighborhoods. Most recently, a whole push to stop cars idling outside schools, uh, because that actually, again, is really bad for the kids in terms of air quality. 
And 101 different you know, rules and norms have come into being to help us cope with this technology of, of the car. Some very formal, uh, some up to the laws and regulations, but some are just uh, norms. And I think with the internet, with AI and so on, what we will end up with is equally complex and multiple Lots of rules, lots of laws, lots of norms to try and get the best out of the technology and avoid the worst. But what's extraordinary is how little that debate happened in the two, three decades when the internet became so central to everybody's life. And on AI, the AI scientists, I think, have done an amazing but very unhealthy job of blocking exactly that kind of the necessary debate about the details of how we how we cope, how we shape, how we adapt. And yet that is exactly where, where we have to go in the next 10 or 20 years. And it will end up probably with lots of different, as with the car, we have lots of different institutions which do the, the regulating and lots of different logics in there because the car is so central to our society. It's not going to be a single notion of, of safety, for example, which will uh, determine, which, which has determined what's done with the car any more than it will with AI. But I'm still struck how many, even highly educated people, still essentially think of science and technology in almost in a linear way as things which just come into society and we then use, rather than realizing there's always a to and fro, an argument, a, a jostling between the push of the technology, the pull of the public, and then usually political social processes of shaping, which hopefully help us get to, to better outcomes in the end. Well, I'm sure you, like me, find yourself in many conversations that fundamentally ends up with two questions. To what extent is technology shaping society and to what extent is society shaping technology? Right. And there's always this, you know, there's always an element of both. But I think increasingly we're seeing that people are accepting the narrative that technology will be shaping our society. And I find myself in curious about why that particular narrative gets sits with people because i think what we have learned over history is that it are societal needs that will shape what gets the funding you mentioned that before you know the power of a government you know is to prioritize so there's to fund something or to defund something why that is increasing to getting funded so this kind of tech deterministic narratives have really grown a strong foothold and in some ways, disempowering people or disincentivizing that very same public discussion, the public discourse that you were uh, re- alluding to earlier. Yeah, I, th- I think his- historically we were unlucky that these immensely powerful digital technologies really sort of emerged into the world at the same time as an ideological swing against public action, against government, you know, ca- character captured by Ronald Reagan's famous saying, you know, the word, the most frightening words in the English language are, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. So there was a whole you know, belief in, in many countries that actually government would get it wrong, would damage the innovation, damage the technology, and therefore better, just laissez-faire, let it, let it be, let the, the tech people, let the market decide. And that was very influential in the 90s, the 2000s, even the, the 2010s in many countries. And I think it's part of the explanation of why there was such a failure to create the necessary institutions and rules needed. Some parts of the world are exceptions to that and were less uh, affected by those ideological shifts. So China, obviously, has moved very, very fast now on AI regulation with its cyberspace authority and many other, other things, perhaps too far for many people. And India, in some ways, has gone further in, I think, very creative public innovation around digital public infrastructures of all kinds, and perhaps a more confident sense that the state has a a capacity to shape and use technologies in ways which wouldn't emerge from a purely market logic. But certainly in North America uh, and and much of of Europe, we've had, as I say, this unhappy coincidence of an anti-government, anti-public mood for a generation or so at exactly the time when perhaps we most needed public institutions to help guide and shape these incredibly powerful technologies. 
And where do you see, although unfinished and, you know, as with anything that has to do with European processes, only when you have the final draft in its final form, can you actually trust what is in it? But, you know, the latest uh, breakthrough in actually agreeing on something yet to materialize the, AI, the EU AI Act, where does that place itself in this landscape that you just referred to? Well, it's good that it's happening. <laughs> Uh, it's taken quite a few years. I think it probably should have happened 10 years ago, but better late than never. And I think the world is now moving very fast. Uh, Joe Biden had an executive um, directive uh, you know, not long ago, which was, to my mind, quite rich and complex. It, it had many different fronts it talked about. So it wasn't falling into the trap of my Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, who's only talked about AI safety as being the only issue uh, which matters. The EU Act, I think, will have a lot of challenges in its implementation. I mean, it's already had the huge challenge of large language models, as it were, emerging in the midst of its deliberations and calling into question some of its principles. And in a way, what I hope we will see, and this is perhaps the, the, the tricky thing for governance of any kind in this space, is when technologies are moving very, very fast, you need a different model of regulation than when they're moving quite slowly. The classic model, which became sort of the dominant theory in the 90s and beyond, was that you set up regulators who should give regulatory certainty to companies, a few simple principles, not to intervene very much, and maybe revise them every 20 years or so. In the case of, of AI, but also of many other technologies like driverless cars or drones and some genomics, there is so much uncertainty about what will be on the market even in two years, let alone five years. I, I, for quite a while, argued we need a different approach, which I called anticipatory regulation, where you create quite powerful regulators who can give temporary, contingent licenses, can say, you can do this, but on these conditions, and we will track the data of what actually happens and then review it in a, a year's time. Or using experimental methods to work with the companies or with the innovators to test ideas out in reality or in test beds or in simulations. It's a very different almost ethos of regulation to the classic sort of lawyer-driven models of the, the late 20th century. But I think in many fields, that's where we have to go. And I think the EU Act will have to end up with quite empowered regulators who aren't, who aren't following over-specified laws about what they can do, but are rather told about the outcomes they have to be achieving and given a fair amount of latitude to determine what rules in what context will best deliver those outcomes because the legislators will never be able to predict the actual conditions the actual uh, technologies they'll be dealing with but i think it will take us a, a few more years to get there and kind of going a bit more global uh we did some work together earlier this year where we launched a framework for the international governance of ai and to our listeners, you know, all of this can be found on our website, both in audio versions and in written versions, uh, should you want to learn something more and also share your thoughts with us. And you refer to some of this, like what are the modalities that are required to get that international governance model to work? Can you elaborate a little bit more, like what you've seen of what type of governance models works? What can we emulate? What shouldn't we be looking at? What are the things that can help us move this, this ship forward? And as you said, you know, there are many, many different layers. And, you know, now working for an organization that is also quite instrumental in setting standards, I of, often end up in conversations where the, the panacea to any conversation that doesn't have a clear outcome is to then push it downwards and saying, let the standards people deal with it when it comes to the implementation. So, like, how do we get that equation right? You know, get the policy right get the regulatory frameworks right, and then having making sure that we have the standards that are appropriate to address all of those um, issues, and in, including all those edge issues that you spoke about earlier. Wow, difficult. Um, so it's, <laughs> it's very easy to be pessimistic in 2023 for uh, of a world where we have you know, war in Ukraine, we have intensifying tension between China and the US, ever more multipolar world, which doesn't seem, which struggles to get its act together on common problems and appears to be becoming more nationalistic, not less. But I think there are two sort of positives to build on. 
I worked years ago on telecom standards, and in many ways, standards is the great extraordinary success story of the world in the last 50 years, not just the standards of mobile phones and, you know, and the internet, but also things like barcodes and uh, uh, and many other Wi-Fi. You know, our, uh, Wi-Fi, exactly. Our lives benefit so much from uh, the kind of boring work done behind the scenes on technical standards. And the other at the global level is the spread of bodies which are not about deploying troops or not even about deploying money, but they're essentially organizations to orchestrate knowledge. The IPCC does it in relation to climate change, giving the world a, a picture of what might go, might go wrong. Uh, ITBES does it for biodiversity. We have a whole host of, of examples, which I, I, I list in uh, some detail in my book, of these organizations essentially trying to orchestrate the commons of global knowledge about issues. And in relation to AI, one of the things I was arguing is that we may at some point need to get to true global governance, some capacity to, to set standards, to regulate, perhaps to penalize countries which do something crazy or companies which do something crazy. But a precondition for anything else is at least some shared knowledge about what is happening uh, what's going wrong, what might happen in the next two to four years. And so we looked at an analogy of the IPCC, though AI is quite different. But at least a minimum step, I think, for 2024 is to create something which brings together the scientists, the engineers and others to, to document uh, the key developments, to have a, a registry of the most important you know, algorithms with the biggest impact, uh, a registry of critical incidents, dangerous incidents, and the way the airlines do. And that's what's helped air travel become so much safer is the the logging, the sharing of, of both problems and, and near, near problems. And then some scenarios work, again, of the kind the IPCC does about what might happen in two, four, six years. And then some more detailed attention to specific issues like jobs or education. This seems to me, this shouldn't be too hard for the world to do. We have the knowledge, we have amazing science, but we're just missing these some of these crucial institutions to bring it together and make it usable. And one of the so final point of the tasks I think it could be doing, there are 200 or so you know, governments in the world, only a handful of them have really any capacity in AI, any deep capacity to understand what's going on. So they, they need someone to be providing so at the draft laws, the draft regulations, the, the things they can be adapting to themselves. The OECD has done a little bit of that, but essentially it's, a, it's a, an empty space, even though AI is, you know, again, shaping our lives every minute of the day right now. This isn't a future problem, it's a, a present problem. And perhaps the G20 next year with Brazil in the lead might attend to this. Perhaps we will get some momentum. Perhaps we will get the funding. It doesn't need very much money, but a, the, the funding which is necessary to create a new global entity as a minimum uh, condition for getting a, a, a grip on immensely powerful technology. And as someone who sort of made a career out of innovation, social innovation, public sector innovation, do you think that there's an element of that we conflated innovation with what is happening in the AI field, which is actually proving to be very unproductive to putting in place that level of governance that you just spoke about? Well, there's a, a, a common phrase used in Europe called the STI trap, which is to only think of innovation in terms of hardware or, or algorithms or software. With almost anything serious in the world, uh, that you want to improve will be a combination, yes, of technologies and stuff and mobile phones, but also of uh, innovation in business models, innovation in how society organizes itself, innovation, how we live our lives in our, in, our, in our homes. And it often leads to a very distorted view of change, this focus on hardware as the only innovation uh, that matters. This is very evident in relation to decarbonization, which is you have a great challenge of the world right now, which I, I'm, uh, I'm, I do a lot of work with governments on that. Now, they've long set up investment funds for new battery technologies or solar or electric cars and so on, which is great. But it's become ever more clear that that's only part of the story. So, for example, I published just a few days ago work done in the UK with some of the governments here 
on home energy change. How do you get much bigger take up of heat pumps and serious retrofitting of homes? The technology is sort of there. <laughs> the economics is sort of there. What's missing is uh, is aligning that with psychology and how humans actually work. And nearly all the crucial innovations we need now are not actually engineering tech innovations, but innovations in how we help people change their lives, deal with the hassle of changing your house to a new energy source and switching your radiators and getting rid of your boiler or emptying out your loft so you can insulate the roof. These are very human issues, um, but they turn out to be the big barriers to progress every bit as much as the purely technology and engineering uh, issues. And I think that applies across the board. We need a, a both and way of thinking about these things. Technology plus humans. Otherwise, we waste a lot of money and, um, and don't achieve the outcomes we want. Just wanted to circle back to one of your articles, Do We Have a Billionaire Problem? So I'm hoping you would actually answer that question. But before I go into the article, because, you know, some of the things you're talking about, decarbonization, how do we get AI governance right, is also an issue of investments. Because we know we have some of the decarbonization technologies available to us, but they need serious investments to be able to be scaled to a level where we can actually do what is required at this point in time. And instead, we're looking at maybe less desirable solutions in that space. And the same thing with AI. We pretty much know what needs to be done, but it comes an issue of incentives and where the power lays. And in the article, Do We Have a Billionaire Problem? You actually share some rather mind-boggling statistics as well. You speak about the staggering global wealth gap evidenced by statistics like, and I'm quote for your article, the richest 1% taking about half of all new wealth. And this is not the least wealth that's just been generated, you know, through the last three years where COVID has also forced us into, you know, more digital patterns. And you write about this over the last decade. And in the two years to December 2021, it was two thirds, so, which means that this has left the world's billionaires worth some 13 trillion highlighting an extraordinary concentration of wealth. And this is, of course, I'm mentioning this too, because this podcast spins out of the AI and equality initiative that is based at the Carnegie Council, where, of course, issues such as exacerbating power, where technology exacerbates power and wealth inequalities is, is very important. But to what extent do you see, I would love you to talk and actually answer the question, do we have a billionaire problem? And to what extent does this privatization of wealth also influence in our ability to come up with those global collective solutions, in your view? Yeah, this is where I think a little grounding in mathematics is quite helpful to look at the numbers as you're doing. So I think we definitely do have a, a billionaire problem or rather a series of billionaire problems. This extraordinary concentration of further concentration of wealth in the hands of a really very few people, mainly men, but also the concentration of billionaire power over the media, with a billionaire owning Twitter X or you know, many of the, the, the dominant media in, uh, in TV, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, and so on. We've, in a sense, handed our, our public communication fields to a small number of incredibly wealthy uh, uh, men. And the result of this is actually a real problem of allocation of money because it's happened at the same time that governments are really short of cash after COVID and uh, you know, the long financial crisis. And if you want one example of the absurdity of it, it was the fund announced at COP28 in Dubai in its first week, which was good. It was a new fund to you know, uh, pay for some of the damage done to countries suffering from climate change, which hadn't contributed to it. The sum in that fund was, if I remember rightly, $550 million, which sounds like a big number until you think that's about one footballer. <laughs> that's, you know, uh, that's, you know, the fraction of a wealth of a single billionaire, because many of them are worth tens or even hundreds of, of billions. And I think much more broadly, we are not getting the money to where it's needed. It's being hoarded by the billionaires who become addicted to money, which they do not uh, do not need. 250 billionaires signed up to a giving pledge, which to their credit, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett had said, commit to giving away half of your wealth, either in your lifetime or in your will. 
but there is literally no data at all suggesting any of them who even who've signed up to this have actually done so. So I think we have a large group of people sitting on wealth, hoarding it, and it is not going to where the priority needs are, whether for for food or for education or for health or for, for climate action. And because the billionaires often fund politics, uh, are often key funders, not just of the of right-wing parties, but increasingly of centre-left parties as well, they often don't dare to raise the issue of serious taxation of the billionaires. Now, that is just beginning to change with some uh, action in the EU. The minimum corporate tax was uh, was brought in a couple of years ago, which the Biden administration played a, a, a crucial role in a 15% global tax. And there may be debate next, at next year's G20 on some equivalents for billionaire uh, wealth. I hope that happens. Some of the best economists, people like not just Thomas Piketty and Joe Stiglitz, but Gabriel Zuchman are working on this, are using their brains to think, how do we deal with this imbalance? But we, we've, we've allowed a, a horrible series of trends to essentially divert money away from its most important uses into buying 10, 20 homes, 10, 20 yachts for billionaires who don't need it. They don't even get much pleasure out of their accumulation of wealth. And I've talked to quite a few. And the prompt for that article was a conversation with two who I'm, I can't name, both uh, worth tens of billions, where we agreed they could probably give away 99% of their wealth with no effect on their standard of living. 99%. And if we stay with the math for just a little bit, so the AI economy has been valued by, let's face it, also companies that might benefit from, from the economy itself, you know, big professional uh, services company, but has been estimated to be worth about 150 trillion by 2025. That's the AI generated economy in itself. And adding that to, you know, the billionaires of the world amounting uh, to 13 trillion of the of the current global wealth. So there's a massive gap here. And of course, that wealth is in large part invested into the same digital infrastructure and the same digital platforms that would generate that new AI wealth equivalent to about 150 trillion US dollars by 2025. How do you, I mean, there's a lot of powers when you talk about when science meets power, there's a lot of power in that 150 trillion price pot as well. How do you see that impact on, on the future trends and the trajectory into 2024? Well, again, I think we, we have to use politics to come to better deals. This is what happened at the end of the 19th century when huge wealth accumulated in the hands of people like Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan and others. And there was then a swing towards believing their companies had to be broken up, the antitrust movement, the taxes had to be higher. By the 50s, they were 90% in the US, you know, a marginal tax for the rich. And a whole series of shifts were needed to deal with this, what was then thought to be a very malign concentration of power. I think a similar shift will, well, I hope, happen in the next 10 or 20 years. And in a way, the deal, and the deal which happened in the 20th century was not so dissimilar. It said, let's not actually slow down the technology. Uh, in, uh, implementation of advanced technologies raises productivity, can improve the, the standard of living of the whole of society. But we need to uh, ensure the losers get compensation and the winners don't get ridiculous gains. And we'll need exactly the same as AI transforms labor markets. And just one concrete example of that, I'm working at the moment with maybe a group of about 10 governments, mainly coordinated by Bangladesh, where we've been looking at uh, how to use data and other tools to understand the potential dynamics of change in jobs markets for people working in, in textiles and furniture and leather and so on. How can you provide new tools to help people navigate to the skills which will be needed in 10 years' time, to the new jobs which may be being created, and not to have their lives ruined by AI? It's a kind of obvious project to be doing. And as I say, there's a number of countries in, in mainly in Africa who are uh, collaborating with us. But we haven't yet got a single billionaire willing to give even a tiny amount of money to help with that kind of essentially social deal, which says, yeah, let's all get the benefits of the tech and you can still be pretty rich 
But, you know, there needs to be some reorientation of that wealth to help the people whose lives will otherwise be ruined so that they can navigate to a better future in that world. And in a sense that the dystopian prospect for 2030 is there be even more concentration of wealth in these hands of these billionaires and immiseration of the lives of tens, if not hundreds of millions all over the world as their jobs are destroyed, their livelihoods are destroyed, and issues like climate change carry on uh, unabated. You reflected a few times already on what you've seen as trends. Where do you, looking ahead to 2024 and even to 2025, what trends do you foresee as being most impactful? And what should we be particularly mindful of as we navigate the future? I think we need to stay calm because I think the next year or two could be quite difficult. I'm fairly pessimistic in the short run but quite optimistic in the longer run. I mean, next year we'll have we'll see a lot of elections, but I don't think most of those... 40, elections 40 will, altogether. ...will grapple with these issues in a way which is particularly wise. Uh, and I think it's very important for people who work in this sort of space not to get demoralised, not to get panic, not to be hysterical, because I, I tend to have faith that the world ultimately deals with its cosmic imbalances, if you like, uh, and will in the end get to some better uh, better solutions around these things, which has often happened in the last 200 hundred years. And that will require people to take a longer view. Uh, I often give the example of the UN, you know, which 10 years before it was set up was completely impossible and inconceivable and, uh, and, a, and a utopian fantasy. And then a few years later, it just becomes reality and obvious and common sense. And many good things are of that nature, but they require people to carry on doing the design work, even in dark days, even when conditions look unpropitious. And I think there will be hubris. My memory of Greek myth, which may be wrong, is that hubris nearly always involves a punishment. Uh, hubris is not; a, it doesn't get away with it. it it's just a step towards uh, a restoration of of cosmic balance. And I don't think the huge imbalances of the present are really very sustainable. I point out in my piece on billionaires that history gives quite a lot of warnings to the hubristic AI billionaires of the present. A fantastic book last year came out in France by Eric Guillard called the, "The War of the Poor," which document which describes in detail Germany in the 16th century when the poor essentially rose up against the rich and slaughtered them in large numbers. Uh, the same happened in France, of course, in the late 18th century, in Russia in the early 20th century. There have been many occasions when people, uh, when regimes which were all hubristic, absolutely convinced they were going to last forever, absolutely convinced of their divine right to rule and be rich and so on, uh, they ended up dead. <laughs> now, I hope we can avoid those kind of brutal corrections, but history doesn't go in straight lines. History does, you know, it has a dialectical quality to it. And I think the real question in the next 10 to 20 years is whether we can do those corrections in a, in a sane, uh, you know, balanced uh, way with reasonable compromises or whether it will be much rougher and much more brutal. And to the point on hubris, it actually uh, links back to when you were talking about Aristotle and what amounts to a virtuous character in our digital age. So this is very much, you know, the Nietzsche version of hubris. How do you reconcile the kind of different contrarians that we all faced with in ourselves and in so society and hubris being described as a, as a vice, as a flaw in that character? Yeah. And, and, and I would love there to be a single billionaire who could say something intelligent about their class and its place in the world and what might be done to fix the billionaire problem. It's very striking. A lot of them are very smart people. I know quite a few of them, but not a single one has said anything thoughtful about them as a group. They will issue any number of proclamations and manifestos on the future of tech or the singularity or this and that. But they're rather lacking that reflective wisdom, which I think we need and is, is, is the essence of a virtuous character, is to be able to stand back and see yourself in that bigger picture with an ethical, uh, an ethical lens. And what would you recommend our listeners to really 
think through what are the questions that should be asking as we enter into 2024? Well, I, I'm next in early 24 launching a new organization focused around the design of institutions. I think part of our problem, we, we're lacking the crucial public institutions we need, certainly in relation to AI, to a large extent in relation to climate adaptation, in relation to the governance of science more, more generally. And we're trying to create a, a, a team. We've got some foundations involved and the UN and others to really focus on what are those needs? What should these new institutions look like? And they can look very different from 10 or 20 years ago because they can use technology in radically different ways from the bureaucracies and the international government organizations of the past. And uh, I would love maybe some of your, your listeners and colleagues to help us on that journey because if we don't create those new institutions, it's quite hard to see how we solve these problems. And in a way, that is one of the lessons of history. Progress often is 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 embedded through new institutions, not just through new laws or new programs. It's through things taking institutional form. And you know, examples in the US, things like NASA in space or DARPA, the inventor of the internet, these were institutions. The results they achieved probably wouldn't have happened without those institutions. So the exam question is, what's the equivalent in the 2020s and 2030s, which could have as, as big an impact on our lives a generation into the future? So asking what institutions do we need looking ahead? What do we need? And what, what will they look like to maximize their use of intelligence of all kinds, to be answerable, accountable to the public, to be swift and agile? Now, the, these are, I think, what we want of the next generation of institutions. And uh, it's, it's not an easy <laughs> question to answer, but it's the one which most needs some really serious brain power in, in the near future, I think. I launched, um, I mean, with your assistance, uh, I should say that, you know, because this builds on the work that we were doing together, I launched this idea some months back that we need middleware. And the middleware, as you know, working in engineering uh, department now is, of course, a way of describing what you need to bind different things together. So this was a, a computational term more or less to describe interoperability, but interoperability is allowing different systems to function together, but you also need that middleware, not the hardware, or the software, but the middleware to actually allow the hardware and the software and all the other components to work together. And so it's not just a question, if I understand you correctly, just to create new institutions, but it's also to creating institutions that actually brings together the best of what we have. Exactly. This is the core of it. When we use the language of the mesh, which is basically the same as middleware, that the institutions need to be meshes of vertical and horizontal. They need to be responsible for the knowledge and data ecosystem around them, not just for what's within their boundaries. They need what we call outside in approaches where they take account of their impacts in the world and the voices of the people affected. And a whole series of really different almost design principles to those which dominated 20th century bureaucracies and 21st century private companies. So it is exactly that kind of meshing middleware, which is the space where these, these things are needed. And that they're not necessarily so hard to create in that space because they're not necessarily cha directly challenging established power and established hierarchies, but they can be incredibly effective one layer below the surface operating quietly in the way that standards bodies have done in the the past perhaps and if one of your countries is one of the 40 have an election next year ask the politicians what they will do to train themselves and the next generation of politicians to be ready for the big challenges they will face fantastic what better note to end this conversation on thank you so much jeff thank you anya jeff our conversation has been incredibly rich and thoughtful my deepest thanks for sharing your invaluable insights and expertise with all of us. To our listeners, thank you for joining us and a special shout out to the dedicated team at the Carnegie Council for making this podcast possible. For more on ethics and international affairs, connect with us on social media at Carnegie Council. I am Anya Kaspersen and I genuinely hope listening to this conversation has been worth your time and left you with something to ponder. Thank you.